Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Friday Night on the Homestead. Tonight's topic tonight is winter feed for your livestock. And we have two special guests with us. Well, three, actually. We have uh, Eric and Monica from Bland's Promise Rant. Promised Land Ranch. That's almost as bad as some of the other stuff I put together. And uh, Courtney from Wide Family Farm. So let's uh, step on down to the panel here. And of course, Al share as usual. Dave is not going to be here. He's going to be well, mo uh, just monitoring the side chat from the side there and uh, troll bashing. All right. So how are you guys doing? We're, we're doing wonderful. Doing great. Are you it's talking good to see you guys again? Yeah, I'm, talk I'm talking to the panel here. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to have you introduce yourselves to here in a little bit. First, I'm going to do the roll call and say hi to everybody, all our um, supporters. First one in was uh, Gear Grinding 19. Then Huga Homestead. That's um, Huga is Danish for fun, and that's CB. Then we have CR, Creative Redundancy from North of the Border. Kaylin Strain, and everybody's chatting. Scroll on down here to the next one. Uh, Fishes on all those life. Carol from Florida, and then we have uh, Bruce Backwoods Law. Uh, and if you missed his uh, open chat, we had just the hour before this. Uh, Uncle Al, Al and I were over there on that. Uh, let's see, Keith Cronk is here. How you doing, buddy? And on down here. Everyone's talk. I love it when everybody talks like this. It gives a ton of information to each other and saying hi and making friends. Uh, Mountain Grammy Grandma. Crystal huh? and Grammy Karen are here. Okay, they're probably down lower because I'm still scrolling down. Uh, we got uh, Mountain Grandma, Aiden Air, and Shady Hill Homestead. And coming on down here, uh, uh, Mary Beth Smith is here. It's talking. I love it. Idaho Garden Girl. How you doing? Another person from Idaho. And hang on. I, got I hate those little pop-ups that come in. Grammy Karen's here. Uh, Suburban Hill. There. <laughs> He's got the hammer ready to start smacking trolls. <laughs> And what else we got here? Digs Outdoors, Copper Kettle Farms. Okay, that's everybody. We're caught up, and I'll try to keep up with everybody's in here. So before we get going, every, pretty much everybody here knows Uncle Al from Die Bullfrog 79 and Courtney from White Family Farm. They've been up here quite a bit. But Erica and Monica are new to a lot of you, so... Take it away, Eric and Monica. Well, tell me, tell us about yourselves. Well, first of all, uh, we have one of the greatest mashup names you can have, which is Erica. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and a lot, and a lot of times, people do that by accident. They refer to us as Erica, and then they apologize. But it's okay. Yeah, we're so used to it now that. Uh, we just kind of roll with the punches now. Yeah, we've been called Erica for months. So Lisa <laughs> Yogi Holler started doing that months ago, she, and he. Yeah, it was on his name for a while. It was Erica, and it was Erica from Bland's Promised Land Ranch. So we just go with it now. This is what it is. <laughs> well, just do you have do you have time for a quick story, Gil? Am I allowed to yes, do that? Yes, I want. Uh, yeah, I want you to tell us about where you where you were from before you came down to Texas. Why you okay. came down to Texas? A little bit about what you've been doing down there. The good, the bad, the beautiful. Well, the beautiful has followed me from the state of Maryland all the way down to Texas, and that would be my, my Ooh, lovely. Ooh, 10 um, points right there, 10 <laughs> points. <laughs> we have, we have, we have eight children. He knows I will follow him anywhere because I'm bringing my kids with me. <laughs> so, yeah, so we started out up in the uh, uh, close to Baltimore, Maryland, and we were up there. That's where we grew up. Uh, pretty much our entire lives. And then in 2014, we relocated across the country down into the state of Texas and wasn't really sure exactly what the Lord had in store for us at the time. Uh, but we wound up uh, finding a 10 acre piece of property where we started an, an adventure 
uh, one that we never anticipated quite being the way that it turned out, which is where we are now. And that is that we try to provide all of our own food. Uh, we try to grow everything that we can right here on our own farm in the event that, you know, up until last year, we never thought it would have ever been possible. But in the event that we didn't have in our at the time, if we didn't have the money to go and buy what we needed, mm -hmm. we could go out and get what we needed. And so that's kind of how we we started this adventure. We started with uh, the the gateway animal, if you will, back in Maryland, which was the uh, chickens, the infamous chickens, <laughs> which I've which I've learned to hate. But uh, nonetheless, we got the chickens and then we kind of branched out to some other smaller animals like rabbits and uh, potbelly pigs. And then uh, got to the point where we had cattle and uh, meat, full grown meat pigs. And uh, now we got chickens, ducks, quail, turkeys. And uh, we don't have the horse anymore. We ate him. We did not eat him. <laughs> My word. I saw, I saw the video. You gave him to some place he was happier. He's a trail I saw horse. the video. He's a trail horse. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, so, so how, just, many, how, 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 how many pigs do you have? <laughs> we have three breeders right now. We have one mm -hmm. boar and two sows that are our main breeding pigs. And then we have three meat pigs right now because, um, we normally only keep two. Um, last cycle, we kept three, and that was a really good amount for our family as we've grown and we're trying to provide more for um, our extended family. And um, and so this time we ended up with three again because we had a runt of the litter that almost died. And we did a video, a couple of videos on him where we just, we were really hoping we could save him. And just by a miracle, we were able to get him through that first couple weeks. And he was a yard pig for about three months until finally he, yeah, he was a yard pig. He, he was a house pig before he, he was, was a yard pig. <laughs> he was a house pig. Oh, and he, he No, he is a Tamworth Red Wattle Cross. Mm. So this this boy is not a little boy, but he was in and out of the house like a dog. I mean, he was like a medium sized, large sized dog. He's the size of my boxer um, months ago, and he was in and out of our house. And so um, he was to the point where he would be running around our yard in the morning and we would let him out of his cage and he would immediately run for all the little hiding spots for our chickens and ducks where they would lay their eggs. And we would have to run ahead of him and yell at him, stop, Peter, go away. And we'd have to collect the eggs before he got to them because he knew all the sweet spots. And so we um, we recently acquired one of our big sows. Um, she's a Duroc, which is a, reg she's a registered um, former reserve grand champion Duroc that the water guy was actually noticed Peter walking around in the front yard and said, oh, I really like your pig. He's, he's like a dog. And I was like, yeah, he is. And he said, you know, my wife and I have a pig that we're looking to maybe get rid of. If I could talk her into it, would you be interested? I was like, a free pig? <laughs> yes, sir. Yep. And so we went and picked her up and we did a video on it, but she was at least 700 pounds when we picked her up. She was so overweight. We kind of put her on her diet and she's lost some weight. And we finally put her in after we've had her since June. We finally put her in with our boar so she can get bred and be a breeder now. But she uh, she had to be on a diet first because Mama you put was the pig on a treadmill. We, we, <laughs> took Mama June, we took Mama June from not to hot again. Right. And that is her name, Mama June. Aww. So the big problem with a lot of first time homesteaders, they overfeed their pig a wrong diet. Yep. You're making too much fat. And it looks bad during the summer when your pig goes and drops dead from a heart attack. You have to balance their food ratio, which I keep telling people. You cannot feed cow food to a pig. You cannot feed pig food to a cow because yep. I've been behind both. And trust me, it isn't pleasant, folks. Well, a lot of people make the mistake of just force feeding their pigs corn 
all year right. round. And that is so detrimental to their health because corn is something that you can give them in the maybe the winter time when you want them to, you know, because it takes a little longer to work off. They're going to burn that and they're going to make that body heat. And so it helps them retain that body heat. But you don't want to give that to them in a Texas summer because you give a pig a bunch of corn in the Texas summer and it is going to hurt them. Yes, it is bad for them. And these people didn't know. I mean, bless her heart. They were so sweet. Well, they loved that pig to death. They loved her, but they almost loved her to death. Well, and she's a sweet, you know, she's a sweet girl. One of, one of the things that, yeah, that you find is that pigs, most of the time, they're opportunistic eaters. <laughs> so if you put something in the cage with them, they're going to eat it. And so, you know, the, the downside is that most people, when you're dealing with an animal that's bigger than you and you can't pick it up, they don't know how to weigh it. And so that's one of the one of the things that we try to teach people is understand the weight of the pig. And you can do that by a simple mathematic equation. And if you understand the weight and then you kind of look online to figure out what weight is considered healthy for a pig, then you can kind of start putting them on that treadmill, so to speak. And, you know, the downside is, uh, Courtney, is when you put a pig on a diet is they look like humans on diets. They're really depressed. And they're like, come on, man, give me some food. I'm tired. I just of want that cheeseburger, crap. man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> give me the yeah, French what, fries. When I eat the pig, I always put beer in it. They're always perk up and happy. Yeah, beer. <laughs> King Cobra. And I bring out the slop bucket and they eat like, yeah, King Cobra in our slops. Great. <laughs> Well, one, one thing that we learned too, Gil, uh, uh -huh. uh, uh, the downside is, especially with show pigs, is the objective for show pigs is they try to pack on as much weight as they can. And what happens in is- In a very short period of time. In a short period of time. And what mm -hmm. happens is the weight is too heavy for their frame. And then they develop arthritis at a very young age. Right. And then, uh, and we, we actually went through that. We bought a pair of show pigs- and one uh, did not do very well birthing. She had a prolapse uh, uterus. Almost, she was she was at the verge of a full prolapse on her very first litter. And her second litter, she had extremely pre premature, which we didn't know she was even pregnant. We had kind of kept her away from the boar. He snuck in and we were like, oh, no. And her second litter, she had extremely premature as she was about, they, I guess it was her body's way of avoiding the full prolapse. And she ended up having nine piglets and she was a great mom the first time and didn't lose a single one. But that second time she had nine and only like four survived. Mm -hmm. So it was really hard. And her pair that we bought with her, he died before we even had him for six months because he ended up developing arthritis in his hips and we could barely move them. So we tried yeah. to give him some medicine to see if it would help. And the vet was like, you're not going to be able to help this joker. So unfortunately we had to withdraw him from that medicine. We kept him alive and comfortable for, I think it was the two weeks to get him off of that little bit of medicine that we did give him. He withdrew from that medicine and then we took him to process and we lost an entire hip full mm -hmm. of meat from that processing. And the, the processor was kind of mad at us. He was like, you know, you ruined my whole afternoon. We opened up that pig and something just burst and it messed up everything on the table. And I was like, he had arthritis. And they were like, well, you should have told us. They were they were not a very nice butcher. Yeah. But needless to say, it was arthritis. He had fluid on his back hip. And um, I lost an entire quarter of a pig. So Yeah, because you don't want to eat arthritis flavored fluids on your <laughs> pig meat. Not a good no, idea. No. Folks. But, but we didn't know. We knew he had had some trouble. We had no idea that that was the fluid buildup. I mean, the vet couldn't have known how bad it was and so of course the butcher was kind of mad at us but man we don't we don't use that butcher anymore so yeah all <laughs> right so cows how many uh cattle do you have yeah eric how many cows do we have well i mean wait just, is the cows like the chicken math for him it no, is no. yes it is <laughs> how many cows do we have eric i'm going to hesitate in the answer in that here's the reason why because we partner with a couple different families and this year we lost a few of the leases. So we were paring down now going into the fall. Are we technically in fall yet? We're in fall. Okay, good. So going into fall, we were at about 27 head. And so we've sold a couple mamas off. We've, we bartered with, for hay with, yeah, we've, we've sold off some, we've bartered some, 
Uh, some were just cow calf pairs. Some were calves. Um, this is the largest um, turnout of calves we've had in a single year. We um, have had six born this year. So that's been, yeah, we've had six born this year. We have six sitting out there right now. Well, some of them are older, I think. I don't know. We, we had a bunch this year. I was pretty excited. I mean, within the past, within the past 12 months, we've had five, six, seven. We've had eight born within the past 12 months, and that's the biggest we've ever had in a 12-month period. So that's the biggest number of um, calves we've had. So that's pretty cool for a 12-month turnaround to have eight calves born in a year. That's pretty awesome for us. So um, I give them a hard time, but it's nice when we're putting meat in the freezer. Yeah, she, she's not complaining about how many head I got when we got it the freezer filled up. And when I'm selling them by the butcher box because, yeah, you wouldn't believe what people will pay for grass-fed beef. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I know a little bit about that. Um, some friends of ours here in Idaho raise cattle and stuff. And last year, my daughter bought one of their um, um, steers from them. And fortunately, they were uh, they told her, you know, you got to book way out. And so she went immediately to check some of the local booker, bu uh, butchers near book down. She was well, who do you go for? We go over here and... Aberdeen. So she called the one over there and got, got one on uh, October 17th, almost a year ago and got it, and, and got it three months ahead of time to get, it was, it was booked up to that time. So she got it and they got 625 pounds of uh, meat off of it. But um, April and her husband were um, about, uh, I guess it was about the first of November we're putting up on the on the on the uh, Shelley um, um, Facebook uh, marketplace and on the I Love Firth newsletter. All right, we got uh, meat for sale. We got this. That you can buy a whole boxes. This they had you know, and they were just you know, stuff was just going. Even here, yeah. where everybody has cows. My goal is to always sell at least one or two boxes. If I can cover the cost of the butcher of my animal, then I'm happy. And then I consider that breaking even. I really, tr I mean, it's not because I have put in costs for hay over the past year or two that animal's alive. I don't really worry about that as much because um, we've had seasons where we were able to graze them for an entire winter. But my goal was always to cover the cost of the butcher so that I don't have to pay for that processing out of pocket. And I pay myself back for that. And then whatever I get on top of that goes right back into the pot for hay for the next year for the other cattle. And that's what I kind of do. It's not about profit. It's more about paying for our food. And I feel like that's profit enough because if I can have someone else pay for two, three freezers worth of meat for me, that's worth my time. Cool. And uh, Wendy at Hardnack Farms just came in. David uh, Carlisle came in. Hi, guys. All right. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and run through the slideshow here. And just to give people out there where we're gonna where we're heading to here. So let me bring it over here. And so, so the big question is froze. I froze again. Especially for those that are farther up north north, the big question is, do you have enough livestock feed to get through the winter? And uh, you always put food away for yourselves, don't you? I know I put food away for myself. So you should do the same thing for your livestock. And your livestock includes uh, your pets, uh, cats, and dogs as well. And remember, cold winter feeding is different than summer feeding, like we talked about with the pigs already. Uh, so we got, uh, you know, there's different types of uh, food you can feed to different types of animals. Some you can mix and match, not all. You know, pigs uh, like specific things we talked about already. And... Uh, Goats are another thing. Goats eat just, you know, depending on the goats, they eat just about anything. And they, I've actually seen, I've actually have seen a goat try to eat a tin can. <laughs> so, you know, little goats, big goats, sheep, sheep are different than goats. Sheep don't eat like goats do. Sheep graze the ground like cattle do. Chickens. Chickens is what I think most homesteaders uh, start out with. And you just can't leave them out there in the in the in the snow and let them fend for themselves. They tend you know. to freeze solid. You yeah. have ice chicken. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you don't just want to give them anything. You know, just dump a bunch of food in there for them. And because I found this little piece of information, you know, chickens tend to 
meet their daily daily nutritional requirements. When you provide higher protein, nutritionally balanced feed, your flock will consume less feed and more treats. And as a bonus, you won't need to buy as much food. And one of the things we discovered uh, from one of the other channels is that on the chicken food, if you, if, it, if, if you soak it for a day or two first, and let it start to ferment, it's more easily digested for the chickens. Right. That's grain, folks. Do not yeah. do that on the mash. No. Yeah. And actually, Al, it, uh, it, it works on the mash. That's true, it, it, but you also have to be careful because a lot of people make a mistake with the mash. If you uh, soak it too long, it ferments. And then you well, have, yeah, yeah. You yeah, have, so if you, but, that's what the thing is. You ferment it just so it starts to ferment, mm -hmm. and then they pr can process it quicker. You don't give them a ton, but it processes easier, and they uh, are you know they're able to get more out of it. Right. That was one of the interesting things I found out from, was it uh, keeping it Dutch or was yeah, it? Yeah, it's keeping it Dutch. Yeah. That, that it, and I think um, um, uh, DJ at Arms Family Homestead did it too. All right. Did horses. You, right. Horses are big animals like cows, but they have a, a little bit different dietary need than cows. And cattle of Europe here in the north. You, they can't graze. <laughs> yeah. Once the ground's covered with snow and the grass stops growing, you're not going to be able to graze them. And you got to feed them. You have to feed them. Um, same thing with the goats and stuff. They need to be fed too. You can keep them together. A lot of people up here do that. The bales come in big rolls as well as medium and big bales as well. And you, so you need to figure out how you what you what you want to feed with, how you are going to feed it, such as the go back to here, the container here, which is where they drop the uh, the bales in, so that so it, cows don't stomp it all all the time. And then of course there's grains and stuff which um, cows need, and beef cows. And dairy cows need a little bit different. I know that. I remember that from when I was a little kid. And you don't want to just get a generic animal feed because there's a lot of different type grains. And some, like I mentioned, that you can't give the corn to the pigs in the summertime. You can in the wintertime. And you don't want to give your livestock the wrong grains at the wrong time of the year. And you can make your you can make your own mixes as well. You can buy this buy it separately and make your own mixes, and it's sometimes a bit cheaper doing it that way. And you have cattle there. You know, you can check with your uh, local extension program from the universities and find out what type of uh, feeding plan you need to have for your cattle because what. The blends are doing down there in Texas will be a little bit different than what they do up here in Idaho. Froze again. Froze again. Yeah, it's getting cold up here. Well, yeah, I'm freezing because all the it's cold back here. <laughs> <laughs> ice cream. We need to be I know. Yeah. And um, yeah, so you you need to find out what it is for the area you live in. What's the best uh, feed plan? And. Right now, around here, people are stocking up. They're already buying up the last of the alfalfa and stuff, trying to get it, you know, set aside for their animals. And that's right. the last one. That's the last one. Yeah. So here we go. So. Be, be uh, easy with me, Gil. I didn't study too much. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you guys a break for a second. And I'm going to pick on Uncle Al because Uncle Al, has, you know, his nephew has the dairy and Uncle Al manages it for him. And beats his nieces and nephews over the head and said, no, this is what you're supposed to be doing. I don't care if you have a PhD from MIT or wherever. <laughs> this is the, this is the real world. So right. Al, how do you, um, you know, talk about, you know, are you're, of course you're down there in Southern California. So it's, well, we're in the central part, the desert part. Yeah. And I told my nephews, you don't sell that land over there. That's 30 acres because we have 30 acres that I rotate alfalfa, oat, hay, and corn. And I keep yelling him, 
you change that feel into the corn, you put this feel into alfalfa, and you put this one for oats, we're going to roll it, or it's oat hay, and they're looking at me like, Uncle Al's crazy. No, you're, I can't they're curse stupid. on this channel, they're stupid. but they're stupid. <laughs> Especially ones from Harvard. Yeah, I, I keep telling them that you have to rotate the fields because the alfalfa put nitrogen in the soil. You put the corn plants on top of it. And after that, you put another batch of alfalfa. Then you put the oat hay on top of that. And they're like saying, what's oat hay, Uncle Al? Uh, that's where we process and make those big rolls. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm like, Lord. <laughs> and I got another... Uh, 10 acres I do for silage. And you guys know what silage is, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you put turnips or do you use corn stock or milo stocks? Well, we, we prefer not to use any of those. Um, down here, we as long as there's not a drought, we have a lot of different options. Now, a few years ago, there was a, it was a significant drought through the one year and a lot of cattlemen were turning to Milo as a supplementary supplemental feed, but, and the cows love it. That's all that was available but, really, but nutritionally yeah. it's not as sound as no. the other, the other hay and they're just going to blow through it. It's just going to cost extra money throughout the whole season. But if that's your option, that's what you got to do. Right. Because uncle Allen's in California if you go down I-5, you see those big hills with the plastic tarps and the tires on it? That's yep. silage. Mm -hmm. And there's different ways to make silage. And yeah. Milo's one. And what we do is we ferment that with uric acid and molasses. So it boosts up the nutritional value of Milo. Mm -hmm. And then we add corn stock, sugar beets, turnips. I go through about 50 different kinds of things. Then we feed it to the cows in the winter because it's mm -hmm. it'll get cold here and the cows enjoy it. We're trying to keep it a secret from the beef producers because if they know about this, okay, where we're going to get our silage from because they'll take every bit of it. I mm -hmm. have to compete with Harris Farm across the valley. And you, if you know what Harris Farm is, that's a big meat producer. So they have about five or six of these things on their acreage. You see how big the silage is? That's wow. the pile they make there just to stack it. That's what they do at the dairy right up the road from me too. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. They'll uh it's not a little pile, that's a full size tractor. Yeah. Yeah, it's a full size tractor. And uh, you know they they'll put their their tarps on and there's all the uh, cut up tires they just start piling on it. It should smell like sweet sauerkraut. If you get a different smell, you did something wrong. Because I keep telling my nephews, smell the silage. If it smells bad, you tell me. And I go out there and yell at people in Spanish and Portuguese, calling them a bunch of nasty names. <laughs> because that's a lot of material that goes bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's, so, uh, that, that's, a, that's a key element there, Uncle. I like that. I, I do a lot of sniffing around the farm because it's, you know, it's funny that you know, wh whether you're, whether you're, whether you're dealing with, uh, you know, m manure or, uh, compost, the feed, uh, everything. I sniff everything. I think it's, it's probably bad because one of my boys actually eats everything. So we've had to stop him. From <laughs> you want, don't want to do that. Well, he licks the mineral blocks and he's chewing on hay. And I'm like, man, you got to stop this, man. You did that. <laughs> he drinks from the hose that we fill up the pig waters with. Um, no, thanks. No. Yeah. You, you got to trim that too as a kid, little kid. That's yeah. one, one word, Aniba. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I don't good. Even think about it. I'm just like, please, Lord, protect this child. <laughs> well, look, when, when it's time to, to worm all the animals, we just line the kids up and squirt it in their mouth. Too. <laughs> Let's some not D, go to kids. that subject because <laughs> enough rumors about horse medicine because I have horses yeah, really. <laughs> and I have to train people how to take care of horses. And this big thing about, you know, leave it to us where we ride our horses and we need that to, because a horse track and a mule track is the same and they have to eat a balanced diet. They cannot be plugged up with grains or feed it has to be a certain kind of hay 
and you have to watch it because Gil knows what I'm talking about. If you get that weird hay, do not use impacted. horse. Yeah, do not use that horse hay on your cattle, or you can't eat the meat because yeah. it's it's a poisonous say. And everybody around here, like that's why we grow our own hay and grow our own alfalfa and corn and oats. That way you we don't know what's in it. No, yeah, we don't trust nobody. Yeah, because your milk, like, hmm. This milk is nice and creamy, but it got an odd taste. I'm looking at them. Okay, who screwed up with the silage again? And I find out, okay, who's the dumbass put, sorry about that word, <laughs> who put three and a half tons. You're just very tons, passionate. It's okay. Who, who put three and a half tons of this vegetable in here? You're not, I have to go check it. Because if I don't check the silage, mm -hmm. I got about 600 or 800 tons of rotten mass out there. And on a strong day, you don't want to be hanging around there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember one time, uh, oh shoot, I was about eight years old or so. And uh, one of the, my, my mom's mare, um, someone had, uh, so had sold my dad some hay and they just delivered it and dropped it off. And they mixed bales in there. And um, he did, he, you know, they opened up one of the bales uh, my old, older sister, my mom opened one of the bales and started feeding the horses, you know, and they did not realize, well, this is the wrong stuff. And I remember my dad out there and a friend of ours, George Duke, oh, the air turned blue and they had the garden hose out there and they're holding up the tail and the arm was going in and getting the horse un unimpacted. Yeah, yeah, because you have to be careful when you're dealing with horses. No, on pigs, I'll teach you Uncle Alan trick. Because a lot of idiots overfeed their pigs with corn. In the old days, they didn't eat corn. They ate oats and they ate milo, which is good for them. Anybody who eats oats knows what I'm talking about. It's good for them. The trick is, if you want to finish the pig properly, you have to get acorns. And everybody's looking at me like, acorns, uncle? Yeah, because wild pigs used to forage for them. If you want to see pig goes nuts, let them through an oak forest and you see these big furrows. Like, what kind of tractor did that? A pig, because they're looking for acorns going through the... But the problem with pure acorn, you have tanning acid and it gets into the meat. You don't want to eat that in the pork flesh. I mean... <laughs> because it's so much tanning acid, it penetrates the pig meat. Yeah. Yeah, so you just, you just need to give them just a little bit of a, of the acorns and stuff. Right, but you have to cook it to drive out the... Yeah. Uh, okay. There is a Spanish pig grower that does. He uh, feeds his pigs nothing but acorns, and it's a specific type, type of pig meat, and I cannot think of what it's called right now at the top of my head. I can't pronounce it. I remember. Yeah, I had two strokes. I can't remember. It's, um, all this stuff. it's, it's a, a lot of money to purchase this, but he, that's what he does. And um, Right. Yeah. Because it's a very lean meat because acorns mm -hmm. do not produce. Your protein ratio is different from the fat. And once you cook it, it's easier to digest by the pigs. Mm -hmm. So you have a lean pig, no arthritis. It's like corn. It's junk food for them. Don't feed it. You don't want to see a, your 300-pound pig going, ah, 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 of a corn. You feed yeah. it acorn mush, and it goes through them. It's already for the kids to eat it. It's good for them. They'll poo better. But you have to <laughs> boil it. You have to wash it out and boil it so it becomes a slop. Yeah. yeah. And a lot and I know. People, I know a lot of the uh, the guys around here talk about with the pigs and stuff. They um, have some um, walnut trees around here, and yeah, those you know, everyone's raiding the walnut trees for the pigs. Yeah, uh, you know they feed the, feed them the the um, the whole nut and everything else, you know, and it uh, helps deworm the pigs. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's black walnut. The husk will yes. deworm it. Yeah, but if you're feeding the meat from the black walnut again, you have to make it into a slop. Yeah, and I keep telling people, and they're looking at me, "What's a slop?" And I'm like, I, "God." This is they don't teach you much at uh, Harvard, do they? Get, or Yale. Kids? <laughs> or Yale. <laughs> Wait, Uncle Al, is that, that who, that's who you got working for you is like interns from Harvard and Yale? <laughs> no, it's my nephews who went to Harvard and Yale. It's like eight years of Harvard. 
You know, you're supposed to have a business degree or engineering or doctor's degree. Uh, we took ad, ad, what was it? Ad revenue something marketing. I'm like, you're like madmen. You go out there and sell the product. You have no idea what the real world is. And when I see their tractor, it has a toilet, a refrigerator, air conditioning. When I used to drive my tractor, uh, you know, uh, International Harvester, it only had like a little uh, umbrella on it. That was it. That. No toilet. Hey, the no one stereo. I have here doesn't even have that. I got a 1939 um, Ford tractor. It don't have rollover rops or anything else on it. It's, you know, I'm out there in the sun. Yeah, you have to be careful when pigs eat anything because they'll pick up a lot of diseases you don't want. So you have to keep the slop fairly clean. Well, one of the things that we try to do too, especially with our feeders, is giving them pasture land to kind of work through so that they can have the grass and be able to graze and be able to move and walk and run. And, you know, I mean, that's just like any other animal that you're trying to produce for food is you, you don't want to cram 40 of them in, in a little 10 by 10 room and just keep feeding them food to, to make them fat. Well, and uh, here's the thing. Some people choose to raise their pigs on, um, we've sold lots of pigs. As soon as I, now when I have, when my girls farrow litters, um, my red wattle will farrow anywhere between 12 and 14. Each year she, we have her bred twice. We do in the beginning of the year and in the middle of the year. Um, every one of her litters, the past two or three litters, I have had almost all of them sold before they're born. I have returning customers. They like the meat. They like what they're getting with the Tamworth Red Wattle Cross. The temperament is good. And I've had some people raise them only on pasture land. I have other people that raise them in small pens, completely concreted, raise them up. And in four or five months, they're ready for butcher. And at six months, they're gone. And so it's all about how you want to raise them. And I guess really that's what you need to know before you buy animals or before you're preparing to have those animals is if you know um, what you're doing with them. And if you want to raise them on that piece of property, fine. But make sure you're prepared to feed them for that many months or that type of, you know, we keep our, like right now, our pigs, our meat pigs that we're going to process, they're not scheduled because the processing is so far out right now. Um, all three of them are scheduled for mm, February or March. That'll put them at a year old. That is way longer than most people spend on meat pigs. But we do not push food. We do not force them. We give them a lot of land that you cannot run around on, like he said. But we also are resourceful. In the wintertime, in the fall, we get pumpkins. Are you kidding me? The first week of November, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to a local pumpkin farm. And when they close down after Halloween, we go get bins. I mean, pallets, you know, the boxes that they sell pumpkins for five or six bucks a pumpkin. We get anywhere between four to eight of those boxes filled with pumpkins. They will last for our pigs almost through January sometimes. Oh, nice. Right. Nice. We'll I'd like to get those for my chickens. Call, right, your local, call your local farms that are doing the pumpkin stuff. Call all those people now. This is now is late. Home Depot. Home Depot. Lowe's. Lowe's. All those places. Call your local places and say, hey, I've got pigs. I've got cows. I've got goats. I've got chickens. My animals would love. Get on your next door app. You know, all those apps that are, in hey, everybody, I have some animals. They would love your leftover pumpkins. Give me a ring or come throw them on my front porch area. Don't really throw them, but come give me a call and I'll come pick them up. I'm telling you, people love to help people. It makes them feel good that they're helping you out. And it makes you feel good that you're not paying $5 for a pumpkin this big. You can do that with apple orchards, pears, peaches, anybody that you see that has those type of plants growing, grab them. That's a great way to feed your animals through the off seasons Right. And not continue to put the just commercial feed into them. And when you do that, we have persimmon trees and we have a couple trees that drop acorns. 
well, I'll have my little kids, like little workhorses out there. I'll be like, get your buckets, kids. Let's have a game. And then we collect it and go feed it to the pigs for fun. Um, but that's a way for me to supplement something that, and it gives the pigs something to have fun with. Cause you scatter a bunch of acorns on the ground and those, you know, eight month old piglets, which they're huge now, they have a fun time. Yeah. They love running for them and rooting and it tears Eric up inside watching them root up his pasture land. But it keeps them active. It keeps their mind sharp. And you're finding another way to care for your animal, the whole animal, yeah. not just, well, they look clean, they're healthy. And they don't. these are great ways to care for them all over because it's not just an animal you're raising to eat. It's an animal that you're caring for the whole thing. Right. And, you right. know, yeah, when you do that, especially with chickens, their mm -hmm. yolks are more orange. Right. They're, you know, everything is better, you know, yeah. instead too. of just constantly feeding them feed. Yeah. I mean, I feed them like I, I rip out my garden at the end of the year and everything yeah. goes in there to my chickens, my pumpkin, like all of that's going in there, you know, everything goes into our pig pen and then the chickens, ducks and all of them, even the turkeys. Now they all congregate in the pig pen area <laughs> because it's, it's only marked off by two strands of hot wire. So all the animals just duck under the hot wire, except for the pigs. <laughs> And they all congregate and they all get along. I mean, we have pigs that eat with all the other animals and they don't care that the other animals are in there. If they did, they wouldn't be on our farm. But yeah. I mean, yeah, they all hang out together and they eat and enjoy those fun things together. So yeah, it, it definitely makes a difference. Right. But also you could do at grocery stores because they'll have um, butternut squash, acorn squash that they can't sell and it's past their date on the shelf. Get that. That's free. And you can make that into a slop too. Yeah. But it also may produce it. <laughs> Which one? Some companies won't do that anymore. We were trying to do that before, and some said they had to stop because it's not sanitary. Li liability purposes. Liability right. purposes. Because I, when I do it, I have a steamer, and I show it because I'm making slops for the pig. It yeah. goes into the steamer at 1,500 degrees. Mm -hmm. Everything's dead in it. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's and that's the thing, you know, we found is it's all about wording. You know, when you go to these places like Home Depot or Lowe's, if you have ag exemption, it makes it even easier. But, you know, one of the things that most stores like now is when you say I'm a local farmer yeah. and I'm trying to get some additional feed for my animals. And we're looking to partner with local stores to supplement the food that our animals yeah. are having. And when you say those words, partnering, local farming, local farmers, local homesteaders, ranch, whatever, and you're partnering with them and you're trying to supplement your animals' food. I mean, as long as they know you're not, your 11 year old's not eating the stuff that you're bringing home. Yeah. <laughs> My 11 year old would. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing, the thing is too, that probably most people that are even watching right now either have a YouTube channel or Facebook or Instagram, and it's very easy to go get a business card made and you just, you know, invite them to look at the channel and yeah. highlight them, you know, and that's one of the things we try to do with people that we partner with is we try to, you know, highlight the fact that, you know, such and such a farm is partnering with us. Yeah, and yeah it gives them kind of a free advertisement for yeah. what you're getting out of it. Yep. And that's yeah. what I'll be doing this week, actually, coming up on my Instagram. I'll be making sure that I highlight the local farm that we go to every November. And for the next couple of weeks, I'll say, hey, make sure you go check them out. They've been generous the past five or six years now. And they've been just blessing us. <coughs> we just want you to go and encourage them, bless them, spend some time at their farm and their local, go spend some time and spend some cash there. And you know, that it just, it makes sense. I mean, you're helping each other. They right. may not be some farmers that are raising animals. They're raising food for our animals basically. And for the, you know, fun of us. So yeah, might as well. Okay, I got. I want to do a couple things here real quick. Just to all those in the chat that have been coming in, I've been trying to say hi to you on the side chat. And yes, I'm using my Gray Man Prepping channel to do the comments. So you see Gray Man Prepping in there. That's me. Even though it says Camp Pet and Family Compound, it's my other channel. Because this is homesteading here, but it actually has a froze again. Froze again. <laughs> yeah, this is the, my internet is a radio telecommunication one, so. It tries to put out more data than it can when I do a live. So every now and then I, but uh, yeah, so this is a little bit about uh, preparedness as well too. But um, I have a special little thing here I want to show right now. Um, let me bring it up here. Oh, this is their homesteading 101, how to choose the best animals for your homestead. 
I watched this thing twice so far, and it is good. All right, and so um, I'm gonna put. I'll put the link in it as soon as I. I'm just show, run a little bit here, and I, the sound isn't gonna play for you. Let's go through it. All right, hey, we know who that is, and she goes through and she talks about all. You know, it's all this is just talk talking about it, and she has some talk, shows some of the pigs and stuff, inserts and stuff. So this. It's, oh God. Go ahead. I was going to say, this is a really good topic, especially for people that are just starting out. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people go, I, I call it gung ho, you know, they go out and they get all this and they get all that. And then they get burnt out on it really quick. Or, you know, especially over the past year or whatever, somebody will go to tractor supply and buy 300 chickens. <laughs> and then they'll come home and be like, um, how do I build a chicken coop? <laughs> you know exactly. Um, so this this kind of topic is actually really really important for people, and I'm glad that you put it out there. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. And this this is the video where she talks about the horse. <laughs> so um, yeah, Eric you was know, so happy about that horse. I'm just gonna say he was so excited. He's like, we're gonna move to Texas. We're gonna be cowboys. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna get on a horse, Monica. <laughs> I went trail riding like twice with my mom when I was like 10 and he, look, he was so excited. He was like, I've been horseback riding. And I was like, when have you been horseback riding? I've when? literally been married to you since you were 19. When did you go horseback riding? He was like, when I was a kid with my mom. Wait, I don't know. Okay. Why, why are you talking about my business? Cause it's just like right. two times. He, right. he thought he was going to be a horse. He thought he was going to horse guy. All right. <laughs> when my dad met my mom, <laughs> It was on the movie set of a John Wayne movie. He just finished a rodeo in St. George, Utah, and they hired a bunch of the rodeo people for extras on the movie set. My dad had been in the road in the rodeo from the time he was 17, a professional rodeo rider. Cool. He was in the top 10 every year for all around cowboy until the year he met my mom. And that's the same year he developed round butt disease. You don't know what round butt disease is? Get a round butt, you can't stay in the saddle. Oh, I <laughs> thought it was an actual disease. disease. You had me so confused. Me too. Like, yeah. I it's, it's called, it's, it's, it's called Did she round... know before she married him? <laughs> no, it, it's a joke with it's a, a lot joke of horse, horse with people. the cowboys because they can't, you know, you you know, you get to a certain age and you get so beat up. It, you just can't stay in the saddle doing the bronc riding, bull riding, calf, you know, you, know, you just, you know, it's just too hard to stay in the saddle all the time. And he couldn't stay in the top 10. So he retired. But anyways, so when I was born 10 months later, <laughs> it didn't take them long to get together. Um, the, you know, they, uh, and when I was about, okay, so I was about two and a half. We bought an acre, they bought an acre and a quarter up in Northern California. We had four horses and some pigs, a whole bunch of chickens and stuff. And so my, my brothers and I, basically we, we grew up, you know, riding horses and stuff. I so want to get horses. I so want to get horses. My wife, the accountant goes, do you know how much they cost? <laughs> yeah, I know I'm not getting them, but I still want to get horses. Aww. <laughs> So I know where you're coming from, Eric. It's just, yeah, I, I, you know, of course, uh, what I want to get, because I actually got a chance to ride one, was this Clydesdale set up for riding. Oh, that's they are the cool. Most, they that's are the most so gentle beautiful. horses. Your uh, quarter horses, your Appaloosas, when they get a, a little burr up their butt, to say, and they don't want you on anymore, they'll ride along, and if there's a branch over there, they kind of steer over and kind of try to get you knocked, not knocked off by the branch with her. A Clydesdale will go around the tree and they don't care if you're on their back. Because so they kind of mm -hmm. have like short man syndrome. The <laughs> Clydesdale are all big and then the other ones are like short and like stubborn. Right, like mules. They're, ju <laughs> they're, they're just um, basically it's the, weight, it's the weight thing. It's like I'm getting tired of carrying this person around. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so horses you know i love horses i want to get horses my sister had several horses she used to barrel race and stuff and i used to go uh after she got married i went up to their place in uh 
um, Draper, Utah, and took care of the horses one summer and stuff. But and even in high school, my brother and I went out and helped the uh, cattle drive there in northern Arizona. And it was uh, about yeah, I just love so I've thoroughly uh compadre with you about horses <laughs> yeah i always enjoy the clydesdales we have a fair and you know there's about maybe 10 people in the county or surrounding county that actually have clydesdales and they bring them in and i that's the first thing i go to is i just love because their big old heads come go right through the thing and you can pet them and you know and they're just so they're so stinking cool they're right. so well, courtney you know, did you see who just came into the side chat who Garden, Garden State. State Gardener. Hey, Garden State Gardener. How you doing? Uh, now, back to reality. If you can see that, folks. Hang on. There they can see it. Well, it's kind of focusing. Um, did you write that with pencil? Uh, pen. Oh, okay. Look how that's crappy handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks. Look. look at the square feet. And then on pigs, you need at least two acres so they can roam around. And a yeah. uh, furrow, but you could raise them in 270, is it 207 square feet enclosure? But it's not, I don't recommend it. But this is from the USDA. And a lot of people don't understand. There's a lot of work, folks. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Yeah. Well, that, that was one of the reasons that, uh, you know, so we're part of it. that video that she did was part of a collaboration. And that was one of the topics that uh, she had uh, wanted to teach on, you know, so for us and, you know, we got to, we got a chance to share this with Courtney on uh, the live that we were on with her. You know, we try to partner with a lot of different families because we came from a city or a suburban type life. We never grew up on the farm. We didn't know anything about anything on the farm. And uh, when we moved down here and then started getting our feet up underneath ourselves, started educating ourselves, surrounding ourselves with people that are much smarter than us, uh, the opportunity came for us to be able to help others. And so that's one of the things that we try to to educate people on is, you know, like Courtney said, don't go buy 300 birds from Tractor Supply because they just offered to sell them for a quarter apiece. Right. You, know, you have to know what you're getting yourself into. It's a little bit easier to uh, be fluid, if you will, when it comes to smaller animals like chickens. Mm -hmm. But I've had people that, um, for example, one of my neighbors that has eight acres and decided to put two cows on it, which wouldn't necessarily be a problem, except for he already had a herd of sheep and he doesn't know anything about cattle. Yeah, and yeah. they're longhorns, which makes everything different. And they're yeah. female. And they're female. Two female, which means they will heat cycle. And we have a bull actively on our property. So yeah. somebody's escaping somewhere. Well, we have yeah. a video on Eric doing a one-man <laughs> cattle drive from our next-door neighbor's house. Walked our bull out of his yard, walked him down the street, and back into our yard. Because our bull is no, very no. chill. No, leave it at that. Well, yes, he's, I, he's, I, such, I, he's a real man. He can... Handle a bull and walk him down the street. No, for real though. Our Did bull you put is a leash on him? Did you put a leash on him? I should have, man. He didn't need to. <laughs> that would have been great. That would have been a great picture for a thumbnail. Walking this big old Brangus bull. <laughs> oh my word. Well, Courtney, it. Courtney, let me let me tell you this. So I, I did this video about walking the bull down the street. I kid you not, like two days later, my dad calls me at work and says, son, the bull's out again. And I said, what are you talking about? So long story short, because I know we're probably running short on time, but my dad spent about an hour and a half to two hours trying to get the bull back in the pasture. With the water guy that we knew from the pig thing. Okay. okay. So same water guy happened to be here. So he had <laughs> help, got the bull finally into our pasture. Back into our yard for us. Yeah. Great. And so my dad came over after I, I got home from work and Monica was actually coming home from a uh, vacation. And so I was trying to get everything set up, get dinner ready, you know, so she could just come home and relax. She'd been on the road for like eight wait, hours. Wait, can you repeat that again? You, yeah. You got I, dinner I cleaned, ready? I cleaned. <laughs> I, I, he didn't clean. He I just dusted. did some other chores. No. 
Please let, don't tell anybody what you can't. What I came home to in the sink. We don't talk let, about let that. Me, let me. We tell, won't talk about what was in the kitchen. Let me tell it my way. <laughs> no, this is not the correct way. Anyway, 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 so my my dad comes over, and he says, he says, son, how many full grown black bulls do you have? And I said, I have one. Why? And then as soon as I asked him why, the the light bulb went off in my head. I was like. That wasn't my bull. That's why, you, <laughs> that's why you couldn't control him. And so the neighbor on the other side, his bull, which probably outweighed my bull by about 500 pounds, had broken through our yard, broken a pipe fence, broke two barbed wire fences, stretched one barbed wire fence. And then when I got the bull into my property, into the corral, I had called the owner and the owner had the um, the dreaded the dreaded disease that we won't speak about right He's now. He's like, I could come, but my parents have the thing. And Eric was like, don't come over here. Yeah, just stay. stay where you are. So uh, I put- You're up, lucky though that your dad didn't get hurt because if he thought it was your bull and your bull's real chill. Yeah. Your dad yeah. just walked it like a bull that could have just- Yeah. And this bull is yeah. a beast. Oh yeah. my Lord. But yeah. that's be all because we have a neighbor who picked up two female- heifer cows or cows because they're not they're they've been bred that were in cycle and there's no bull there to keep them contained so when you purchase animals you have to know enough about them to know how to take care of them it's so important and that right there is a huge reason because they, they destroyed two fences mm -hmm. and they could have hurt people that bull yeah. bulls are very dangerous <laughs> right uncle al yeah, because I I know personally I got stomped by a whole team bull. Good night, Wendy. And last time I woke up, like, who's president? Is it George Bush no. Jr.? No, it's this guy, Barack Obama. No, I'm going back into the coma. It's like <laughs> the whole world changed, and like, I also got ripped off by my nephews too. Uh, we can't trust you. You have brain damage, Uncle Al. So. We're taking all your properties and funds and your guns and everything mm -hmm. else. And we'll take care of you. Don't worry. We have what they call it. The, it the, it's not the lady with the whip. Uh, executor. Or, yeah. Uh, they take care of old Uncle Al. Now I fought all the way back. I can drive, kind of. And I could do things, kind of. So, And I got the right to vote again. So yeah. I'm... A, on the men, I'm going up there and I'm getting rid of the, the gut. But I tell a lot of people, if you do animals, research very yeah. hard, especially the small ones, like rabbits, mm -hmm. like quail, like fish. I don't want to talk about the fish yeah. because... And get oh. involved in your local programs. 4-H teaches yeah. you all of that. You right. know, if you have kids, get involved in that. And, you know, I can't tell you how many rabbit conventions I have been to. <laughs> like, not seriously. So like, yep. you know, get out there and get your kids involved in it. And 4-H, I mean, we've shown our turkeys and I learned so much about turkeys and I, I love turkeys. I think they're the coolest things. And um, chickens, you know, you don't need a, well, so many people think you need a rooster to get yep. eggs. Oh my goodness. That cracks me up. My <laughs> grandfather like, told me the one day, he's like, well, do you have a rooster? And I'm like, uh, I probably do. I got like 30 chickens out there. He's like, well, you have to have a rooster to get eggs. And I'm like, no, you don't. He's like, yeah, that's what I heard. I'm like, I get eggs all the time yep. from all the girl chickens. And I didn't need a rooster to get them. Oh, okay. I'm like, no, no, you, 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 only need a, you only need a rooster if you want to get fertile eggs yeah. to right. grow more chickens. <laughs> Yeah, now I heard that a rooster keeps them happy, though, and then they lay more eggs. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, because I got some chickens out there that don't like the roosters. You know, I think, me. yeah, I think actually I've had more trouble with roosters with the girls. But I mean, look, the girls, hens are born with the amount of eggs that they're going to use in their lifetime. And once they start spending them, they just spend less and spend less. And then you just eat them. So, I mean, it is unfortunately, but that's life. Well, I'm sorry, I can't eat my legs. Right, or you can do oh, like a girl does and keep on the roosters you don't really need and a lot of people look at me like what's that it, it's like a steer except yeah. small and you do it on chickens my mom loved having having chickens um she had uh i know she had a bunch of banties she had some rhode island reds and something in between the only rooster she kept 
were the banties mm -hmm. because the banty roosters wouldn't tear up any of yeah no youtube i'm not getting into that sort of a subject <laughs> <laughs> but the banty roosters being light and small were able to keep the bigger chickens happy yeah all right. Um, I want to cover something here really quick here. Um, and if you want to stick around, we can go. We can go longer if you want to. Um, coming up here on uh, Tactical Tuesday on Gray Man Prepping, uh, the topic is stocking up for Grid Down event. Ooh. Wow. Next Friday night here, I, I'm trying to get Moose from Air Guns of Michigan to come on and talk about air gun hunting. Hunting fun. deer, moose, whatever, using air guns. And uh, so I'm still working on that. Don't know what's going to happen. But the big one is in two weeks on October 29th. Uh, let me get this here. So I got to do this right here, folks. Hang on a second here. Wait, so we're not the big ones? <laughs> no. Oh, I'm sorry, but this is the big one. What is it? Oh. Doc Bones and Nurse Amy are oh. coming on. We're doing. We're going live early on the 29th. We're going live at um, five o'clock Eastern time. They're coming on, and they're going to be going over a bunch of stuff. And specifically, they're going to be going over their fourth edition handbook. Uh, uh, handbook here for emergency. This thing is 30 percent bigger than the third edition. They sent me for free the color version, which is an $80 book. They sent me for free. This is number number 18 of 500. Wow. And they signed it for me. But they'll be on here on the 29th, and we're going to start early. I'm going to have a Bruce from Backwoods Law and Dave from Southern Ohio Prepping. Dave has had, had, had them on his channel five times now. And Bruce is as a former MP and firefighter and EMT. So he has medical training and I'm going to be broadcasting it. Yeah. I'm going to be uh, uh, broadcasting to both channels that night. That's cool. So one's going to be monitoring camp patent family compound. The other one's going to be monitoring uh, gray man prepping. And I'm not sure if they're going to do any sort of giveaways or not. But I know they're putting together a, um, a PowerPoint stuff. They're going to be sending me a PowerPoint so I can run it for them because they don't like doing the multiple screen thing. Hey, Cecilia. And <laughs> Bruce says, I'll only charge you $500 to give you hands-on experience, Gil. <laughs> and uh, so this is what's coming up in two weeks on October 29th. And, yeah, it's – yeah, it, this, seriously, this is – I mean, I, I am so jazzed about this book. I was about ready to get in trouble with my wife and buy the book. And I was I was just getting ready to order it and I got the email from Amy saying, hey, we're sending you the, uh, the color version book. Mm. She saved my life. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so this is what's coming up on the 29th. So everyone out there, I'd appreciate it. If you have a channel, put something out about it, spread the word around. And it's so it's going to be Five o'clock Eastern time on the 29th. And there's actually some stuff on tummy problems and stuff, which comes in handy for uh, Halloween. <laughs> but yeah, uh, this book this book is, you know, yeah, in incredible. I mean, the, the, they, they made the print smaller, a little bit smaller to fit more. So they, and they still, it's about that much wider than the previous one about that much taller and about that much thicker. So nice. yeah, it is It is a, a lot bigger and stuff. And this is absolutely probably, if you're on a homestead out away from anywhere and the first responders are 30 minutes away, you want to have this. With, and, with a correct first aid kit because most yeah. first aid kits are ouchie boo-boo kits. It's like the vet kit I keep telling people. If you have big animals, you should have a veterinarian kit, even yeah. for your pets, like cow, mm -hmm. not cows, uh, dogs and cats. Because mm -hmm. I tell everybody, if you don't have the right kind of vet kits, 
vet there vet kits for your animals they will die and the saddest thing is seeing your dog die from something that they because the dogs are stupid they'll eat anything and they <laughs> drink anaphylis off the floor and you're trying to pump out the crap out of their stomach <coughs> you take them to the vet by that time your dog's dead yeah um so talking about first aid kits mm -hmm. real quick here just uh, another shameless plug for uh doc bones and nurse amy their website, doomandbloom.net, they sell gunshot wound kits, ultimate family uh, grab-and-go survival medical, the first aid large stomp supreme. That's a $900, $950 kit. It's huge. It has everything. You have you know a doctor, you have the doctor come over, he has everything in that kit to do. Uh, dental uh, first aid kit. Um yeah, it, or is the uh, they got the suture kits. They got you know everything. You just go. You got to go deeper into it. But yeah, they got all the different ones there. Uh, so yeah, if you, you know, like I say, you know, you know, I don't get anything. You know, yeah, I do. I got I got a free book from them, but I don't get anything that anybody buys from them. But hey, it's a great um, source. I mean, you know. And, you know, Doc Bones has an MD after his name. Nurse Amy has a, what is it here? Uh, APRN slash midwife slash after her name. <laughs> and so, yeah. Okay. I, done a lot of stuff. Now, anything, uh, Courtney, do you have anything coming oh, up? Oh, yeah. My poop a ween contest. So <laughs> on the 17th or 18th on Media Monday, I am going to do a wheel of names for the people that re have registered for the Poopaween contest in my video. And those three people will get chosen to um, carve a pumpkin live on the 24th um, at 930 after Garden State Gardener goes live. And he is um, one of the judges. Um, the first place prize winner will receive a squatty potty. And the second one will get a wide family farm t-shirt. So yeah. And they have to be able to carve a pumpkin in 10 minutes. So yeah, I have to say, I'm still a little bit concerned about her fascination with poop. <laughs> All right. I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to explain it to you. Uh, on one of her live streams at night. We're all, you know, a bunch of us are up there. I think there were like nine of us up there. And um, she goes, I'll, I'll be right back. And it all of a sudden, oh, she's going poop. She's going poop. <laughs> because she's leaving. And the uh, and then someone else went out to get coffee. No, he's going. He's not getting coffee. He's got to go poo. And that's yeah. how it started. And that's then it became. It then it became. We became on 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 the guys up on the panel. I became became the poop troop. Yeah. That's yeah. And that's, anytime that's anybody ever got off the air or off to do something and they took a minute okay like, oh, i'm gonna have to i'm gonna kill my green screen here for a second green screen none so i can show oh look you won that's so cute oh my word <laughs> oh my word yeah. and she got because i don't wear short sleeves she got me a long sleeve one very nice <laughs> Well, you know, that's my first reaction when any of my kids say they're not feeling good. They're like, I don't feel good. I'm like, you should probably go poop. Well, I mean, if you if you live on a farm, you deal with it every day. Yeah. I know I do, especially with chickens because they poop everywhere. Well, Eric's and out there smelling so poop. Yeah. So it just fits in with everything, you know, and um, yeah. and it's funny and people laugh. And that's really what we're about is making people laugh and have fun right. at, at night. So. And now no. Uncle's the wild cannon of the group. <laughs> and also, I'm a Sunday school teacher, but I have a lot of past experience, and I don't want to tell younger people don't make the same mistake. Now, I have questions for Erica and Monica. Are you ready for La Nina winter? Because we're going to have a bad one. Remember last winter when everything froze over? Are you guys ready? So I think we're part ready. I think we're getting there. Um, <clears throat> I know, like, in terms of, like, firewood for us, we run our entire house on our um, wood stove over the summer, over the winter, because with a Texas summer, um, that balances out my um, electricity bill very well when we don't have to turn on electricity um, via, you know, heat, because I, I cannot do heat 
um, the heat pump in the winter. No, not happening. Um, so I watched my bill go from like $400 in the summer with two air conditioning units to, um, you know, $200 or less in the winter. So I need that winter break. So we have plenty of firewood, I think, that's stored up, that's ready, that's seasoned. Um, right? I think. I think. You better know. I'm pretty yeah, sure. But, but well, in, terms, in terms of food for the animals, we're working on getting that too. That's actually something we were working on um, talking about is how many bales of hay we're going to need for the season. So we're trying to get rid of some of our weanlings. We have um, a bunch that are being weaned right now. And once we can get rid of them, then we can move all of our big girls and big boys into place where they're going to be for the winter and then be able to provide food to those places um, and make sure we have enough bales because in the past we've been able to either buy just enough hay or um, sometimes a little bit too much, but it's always, it's, it's very tricky to find out uh, to figure out exactly how much hay we're going to need for right, it. Because buy. remember yeah. kids, this is a La Nina year and everybody on the mm -hmm. West coast, forget about the East coast, the West coast had trouble with silage, hay and alfalfa. So if you don't order now, it's like when December rolls around, what hay or what oat hay? And yeah. then you get the weird <laughs> hay from Canada. Nobody likes that. <laughs> well, we have local people that we have resources to get hay. We have a bunch of people that we know that bail. And then we're able to either trade. I just traded um, some beef for some hay bales and we traded some cattle for some hay bales. So we had 27 bales of hay that we got um, without spending a dime. I mean, we good, essentially good. traded what we had, but we still need at least double that, I believe, for the season. At right. least, I think we're going to need at least, you know, 60 bales. Probably. Yeah, because I always <laughs> worry about. Uh, I I tell people if, if this is your first or fifth year homesteading, you have to make sure everything's okay with the animal because it looks bad. You go out there and like all the cattle's are dead or all the pigs are dead or all the sheep's dead. Why? They froze to death. And it's yeah. like, I live in California, but I keep telling my nephews, we might get a cold spell. Mm -hmm. You don't want 40 cows going, ah, 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 ah. And sound like me because I have asthma and some other problems. You don't want your whole herd doing that because you know what I'm talking about. If your whole herd does it, you have to call the vet. And the vet's laughing. Yeah, it's time to make money. Yeah, I mean, so <coughs> you know, that's that's the thing about homesteading <clears throat> is learning how to plan. And, you know, the, the first year or two is is the hard lesson, you know, where you don't realize that you have to plan out so far ahead. Yeah. But, um you know, I think I think a couple of years ago when they were looking at selling Milo for hay, it was really, you know, kind of my eye opening uh, experience to know that, OK, I finally got this under control because <clears throat> I was telling my friends, hey, if you don't. OK, that wasn't meant to be said. Hey. If you don't <laughs> have if you don't have your hay yet, you need to get it because of the shortage of rain the most people aren't able to have three cuts this year. They're only going to have two yeah. or they're only having one. And so, you know, <clears throat> it's one of those things for us that I will get my hay usually in September in some places that's late, but here in Texas, usually people. October. Yeah. But usually, usually in colder environments, I'm sure you're preparing, you know, in August, September, whereas here uh, the cold months really don't set in until like December ish. And that's when people are like, oh, the grass isn't growing anymore. And I just realized that it's a dirt patch out there and we, di we didn't get hay. And so, you know, unfortunately, and I don't I, I don't ever try to take advantage of people, but I do buy enough hay for myself and then extra in the event that I do need to help a friend out. But for anybody else, I sell it back to them and raise the price a bit so I can try to make back some of my calls for hay. And yeah, the right. way that the way I look at that is, you know, it's your poor planning that puts you in this position. Because we were prepared, we can actually pay back ourselves a little bit more um, from the, you know, to be because because we were prepared early enough. Right. Yeah. The thing, the thing, the thing that we found too is when you when you're prepared, you can you spend less money. You yeah, know, when I have to answer a serious question on hay. The trouble with Canadian hay is sometimes you get good hay. That's not a problem. Sometimes you get straw and weeds. That's the problem. Like you're going to feed your cows and you, 
you unroll the roll or put it in there and you find out it's 50% straw. The cows will eat it, but it's like they're eating junk food and they won't get nutrition off of it. Yeah. And if it has weeds, you know what bloat is, right, guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's from bad hay. Your cows yeah. will bloat. And you don't want to be at the wrong end of a cow when it has bloat. Not well, not to mention, if you have a lot of that garbage grass, too, you can get spear grass. We lost yeah. a cow a few years ago. She was a little girl that um, we got from an auction, and we tried so hard to keep her alive. And she had spear grass, is what the vet thought, had spear grass stuck in her throat from a batch in some hay she was eating, caught spear grass in her throat, and she always coughed. And so here I am trying to sell cattle because I was having some cattle. Pe I was having people come look at cattle, and she's out there going, eh. <laughs> and people are like, she's got pneumonia. And I'm like, no, she doesn't have pneumonia. She's got spear grass. We take care of her. Well, she ended up basically just deteriorating and we couldn't save her and she died. And it was sad because we really wanted to keep her and try to, you know, get her through that hump, but yeah. we just couldn't. But, you know, there's a lot to be said for knowing what kind of, what kind of hay you're feeding your animals because the lower quality hay means you've got to deal with protein tubs and that'll add to your cost over the winter as well, because if you start seeing your cows eat from those trees because they're not getting the nutrients in the ground. And if you watch your cows and you know your animals overall, you're going to spend less money because you're going to be prepared better for them when they encounter right. those times where their their nutrition is up and down and you can be right. prepared for that. Right. All right. Um, before we wrap it up here, because um, I believe uh, Carol's going live in about 12 minutes. Um couple things I want to uh, point out. Well, all right. In watching uh, Eric and Monica's uh, videos, you know, and everything, I got inspired. And so what I got inspired on was their logo. And then, yeah, I kind of like, oh, that's kind of cool. Nice, plain, simple, easy to do and stuff. <laughs> and then I... Um, I, I, I caught the end on, on a couple of your, of your videos that you're doing the branding, the brand. And I figured, okay, I'm going to change. I, I, you know, I have had a couple channels, most notably two family um, homestead who basically helped YouTubers out run stuff on Tuesdays and stuff and telling me to keep up to change my channel up. So I changed it up today. And that's what mine looks like now. I created a new no. uh uh, avatar and a new thing for it, and oh, you and you, know, you, you kind of inspired me. You know, to go ahead and use the state of Idaho. I love and it. Do it. That's awesome. That looks great. It looks really good. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, and hopefully we will. You know, right now what we have here. So I got six acres here in Idaho. I got one acre on one side of the street, which I, we just bought in January, where I'm at right now, and it's got a. Uh, he has a, um, an old grain silo that he cemented the floor on and cemented a big run on. And he was raising 14 pigs out there uh, in it. And, you know, you know, plenty of room for him. It was all, you, we've never smelled the pigs across the street. Pigs but are very I, clean animals. If Yeah. You, yeah, they overall, they're not, they don't choose to be dirty. It's yeah. people that make them dirty. Right. So I got five acres across the street and... Before we bought that, Brandon, who owned this over here, used used to rent um, three and a half acres from the uh, the people that owned that property over there and ha had his cattle out there. And so, um, basically, what I want to do is I want to get some, get you know, at least one cow or one cow, one steer for beef in in a, in a buy it in the spring, and then the following spring buy a second one, and then that October harvest the first one and the next uh, next spring get another one and just that way i'm uh, you know have harvesting after the first year or so i'm harvesting one every october and of course with my daughter and her uh, husband and four boys over there and if my two boys come from california up here i'll, I'll just about take care of us for a year right yep Gil, one one thing to remember about cattle is they are very social. Mm -hmm. So you may not necessarily want just one. Right. You may, you may want to buy them as a pair 
buy one okay. a little older, ready to harvest, maybe a little bit earlier, but have that backup so that they're raised yeah. together. And then when you're ready to harvest the one, you're ready to purchase the second one. Well, I got uh, one of our neighbors. Oh, okay, my, my, my daughter's across the street that way. So the neighbor across the street that way from the from the big property, Curtis, um, he was bought, he would buy a pig or a cow from Brandon. So I'll get with Curtis and say, hey, do we want to get two? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you know, split we we'll split the cost of the feed over here, uh, and you know we'll do that, and that way we'll, we'll get two right off the bat. And of course, then my daughter may want want, want a second way. We'll say, no, no, let's get another one. We'll you know. You know so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> also, too, keep in mind that you have to make sure that with all the processing and stuff, these people are booked so far out. So the minute you decide to get a cow, call your local processor, find yeah. out what they're going to charge you per pound, find out if there's a flat fee for if they come under a hanging weight. You know, from the time they're they're brought in live weight, they lose anywhere between they can lose about 50 percent off that hang of that live weight to hang. And then from the hang weight, you can lose another 40% or 50%, depending on whether that was grain fed, grass fed combination. So you may have a thousand pound animal that hangs at 500 and then you're going to come back with 250 pounds of meat. And so you've got to remember those ratios, but also like our local, our butcher will charge us if that animal comes in under 500 hang, she charges us a flat fee of $475. Wow. So I'm going to pay more per pound under 500. Right. So my goal was to always have <coughs> our cows that we're taking in for butcher above a thousand so that I know I'm going to pull at least a 500 hang because then I'm only paying 90 cents a pound for, for butcher. So I'll pay 90 cents a pound. That's not a problem because then I have time. Then I have a little bit of funds to get some specialty items. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind and make sure you're getting those prices planned out ahead. Prepare that part first yeah, so right. that you're fully prepared when it's time to actually go to butcher. There's only well, very we're probably not going to get, get uh, a, uh, the first one probably for about at uh, least a year and a half yeah so I, I want to uh i need to get the other tractor up and running so i this year uh the field um i kept all the morning glory down a, a disc in it and what i want to be able to do is to start uh putting out the um um sorghum get, get part of it done and put it in, in mm -hmm. sorghum because our cows when we had them my dad put in a quarter acre of sorghum and they were the happiest cows around. When you have a and, good solid pasture, you're going to have really good looking cows. So if you have a yeah. good pasture grazing area that you can take time to get that land perfect for them, like really yeah. good, you're going to have some happy cattle. Yeah. And here you're limited, <coughs> you're limited to uh, two cows or two horses per acre. Yeah. And, and so basically I, I have um, between the gardens and everything else over there, I have, about almost three acres over there. And I have a half acre on this side that I can graze them on over here as well. And, and during the winter time, I'll just move them over here and winter feed them here on this side over here. So I'll be good, good on that. But um, yeah, uh, Brandon said he'd be come back and help me anytime I wanted to got uh, Alice who, uh, um, who basically they have, they run a bunch of cattle too. And she said they'd help us. In fact, that's probably who we'll buy the the, uh, the young ones from. And um, because we're not going to get a bull to breed, we're, you know, too small of an area here to do it. Yeah. But the so. main thing, folks, a lot of veteran beef ranchers usually have their own butchering staff. That's an investment you want to look in the future. It's not easy because my nephew's, when I keep hitting I've the done it. it's not easy and you have to do code because they will expect your slaughtering area. And I live in the evil country of California stand. <laughs> so they're going to sniff everywhere and you Alrighty. have to bring it up to code. So I'll catch All you right. guys we're, up, uh, we're getting close here. Um, um, it looks like um, Carol's going to go live in about uh Four minutes. So uh, I'm gonna see if I can grab her uh, if she's doing it here. Let me see that she's got the the link up already. 
I wanted to say yep. before I let you guys go, I wanted to say there is, I'm going to be putting a video out hopefully next week. It's, um, it's a little challenge that was offered up by Yogi Hollow Farm, Lisa over there. It's called what's in your farm first aid kit. And I thought it was so important because most people don't think about a farm first aid kit. So I know Alicia from Country Mama just put one out today, I think. And um, I'm going to go ahead and do what's in our farm first aid kit next week so that you guys can see. But it's really important. I think hopefully more people will kind of catch on and maybe show because, you know, Courtney, you guys have more turkeys than I do. And you have more of a poultry thing. And I you know, I know what I have for my poultry, but I would love to see what you would have in something that you would keep your first aid kit wise. What do you have yeah. prepared for your animals? So I'm hoping that a bunch of different people join in because honestly, totally. it's a great it's a great idea to, you know, collaborate that way because, you know, what a great idea to be able to hit that hashtag and get some are ideas. You gonna, are you going to tag people in um, in the collaboration or? You're yeah, just I can. To... I was thinking about okay. just starting a playlist and having, you know, because it's Yogi Hollow put it out like a week or two, maybe two weeks ago now. And like nobody's done it. And I'm like, oh, oh I'm on that because what a great way to encourage people to say, hey, you've got to be prepared. Just like Uncle Al said, for your animals. Yeah, mm -hmm. because what happens when you don't you can't get out to the feed store because yeah, I have a whole I have a whole drawer in my basement of nothing yep. but first aid for my uh, chickens. Yeah, I have some for my pigs. I mean, look, I castrate my own pigs, so I know how to I know first aid, <laughs> stuff, but, um, you know, you got to have those things prepared. And it's not something that a lot of people think about until yeah. they're, an animal's injured. And then they're like, oh, crap, what am I going to do? I got to go run to the Walmart to get something for my animal. But if you have it, yeah. it's a lot easier. Or if Walmart has it, because exactly, you know, there for a while they didn't have peroxide or alcohol or anything yep. like that because people were using it for hand sanitizer and whatnot. Exactly. So. Yep. Having those stores up for your animals super important because you're going to run into a problem. And like Uncle Al said, watching your animal die, especially when you care about it so much, it's hard. Especially when that's an investment. Animals are investments. Also, I got to leave on that. Uh, note now because I'm going to check over Carol's uh, live stream. Yeah, here's a tip because Uncle Han used to do lambing and also castrating pigs. You know what's a lamb fry or a pig fry, right? Mm -mm. It's like chicken McNuggets. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wasn't going to answer that because I knew what it was. We just give them, we I do not, I do not eat Rocky Mountain no. oysters, I do not eat the, yeah, no. <laughs> We just throw them I'll to the chickens. Go. The chickens love them. <laughs> All right. So I put the link to Carol's uh, live stream in the chat there. Um, guys, I mean, Carol gives uh, Courtney and I a lot of support. So let's head on over there and for her late night thing. And um, thank you very much, Eric Monica, for thank coming you. out up here. I think everyone, I know I did, learned a lot. And uh, just to everyone out there, Stay happy no matter what life throws at you. Stay safe. Don't go out and do anything stupid. And most important of all, keep on prepping and getting your supplies in. All right?